Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Mount Olive. So glad you could join us this morning. We have a guest pastor with us today, Pastor Phil Kelpine, um, formerly the pastor of St. Peter in Freedom, and now in his retirement, he is serving as the Director of Mission Advancement for Truth in Love Ministries. He's here to share God's word with us this morning and tell us a little bit about the work that Truth in Love Ministries is doing um, in, our, in our church body. We're going to begin with a hymn on page three in your worship folder, Blessed Jesus at Your Word. Lord's blessings on your worship this morning. Able, please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worry and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
We pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray, and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. In our first lesson, we see an example of a young girl who knew who her God is and what her God is capable of. And she couldn't help but share that news with others. A reading from 2 Kings chapter 5. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel. She served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. This is the word of our God. We'll join together in singing God's word. We sing Psalm 116 together. Verses 8 and 9 of our second lesson will serve as the basis for our sermon this morning. We're reminded that we are saved by grace through faith alone. Reading from Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. 
the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of our God. In our next lesson, we hear Jesus reaching out to a woman from a different culture, from a different place, from the the land of Samaria. A reading from John chapter 4. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, believe me, woman. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. This too is the word of our God. We join together in singing our hymn of the day, By Grace I'm Saved. Please note we'll pause for the children's devotion after verse 4, so the kids can come on up during verse 4.
Good morning, children. Thanks for coming up here today. Uh, I have some things that my wife let me take out of the kitchen this morning, and I wanted to, to bring them here because I want to use them to illustrate something to you. You know, the Bible, the Bible says that God just pours out his blessings on us in every day-to-day life. And I'm going to use this cup to kind of illustrate that's you, that's me, and this water is God's blessings. And what I'm going to ask you to do is, is name some blessings that God gives us, that God has given you. Can you name one? Okay, uh, God has given us a family. What a wonderful blessing, right? Okay, a good shelter. We, we, we go to bed and we get up in the morning and it's raining, but we're dry because we got a shelter over our heads. So that, that's a blessing we have every day. Yeah. A bed so we don't have to sleep on the ground. Yeah, and the older you get like me, the more you appreciate that nice soft bed. You betcha. So we'll, we'll talk about more blessings. Can you think of something? Yeah. Can anybody else mention some blessings that God gives us? Well, did you come to church this morning? Did you come to church this morning without eating? All right. Every day, every day you get up, there's, there's food to eat, right? Can you think of some other blessings? Water. Yeah, you get water. And that, that blessing is always there, right? God keeps providing it. What's the greatest blessing that we have from God? Yeah, what God, and what has God done for us? All right, he he died on the cross. He he sent his son Jesus to pay for all of our sins. And, you know, the truth is we could go on all day long and we could talk about the blessings. Our, Our lives just overflow with God's blessings. And God does that for a reason. And one of the reasons he does that is because he wants his blessings to spill out of our lives into the lives of others. The more we think about everything that God has done for us, the more we we not only have joy ourselves, but we can tell other people about it. You know, you can tell me, you can sit here this morning in church, and you can tell me about God's blessings. There's all kinds of people out there who don't know about God's blessings, and we can share that with them. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning, the importance of sharing how much God loves us with other people. Let's, let's fold our hands and pray, okay? Father in heaven, we thank you for every blessing that you give us every day of our lives. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to let those blessings and the knowledge that you give us of your love spill out of our lives into the lives of others. Help us to tell other people about your blessings. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming up, children. You can go back to your seats now. Grace, God's amazing grace is yours. Through faith in our Savior, Jesus, it's a free gift to all of us. A portion of God's word that I want to focus our attention on this morning is recorded in the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Christians in Ephesus, the 8th and ninth verses. We just heard it before. I'm not going to read it again at this time. I want to start out by by talking to you about a a friend of my wife's and mine. Her name is Susan. 
Susan is a former Mormon. A little over two decades ago, by the grace of God, she was brought out of the Mormon faith and became a Christian. A few weeks ago, uh, my wife and I went out to breakfast with Susan. And it's amazing, even though it's been over 20 years since she became a Christian, she still gets emotional when she talks about the gospel. And she remembers what her life was like as a Mormon. She says that, that it was like a heavy weight on her heart that burdened her. A heavy weight of guilt that she lived with every day. She talks about how, how she knew that she could never, ever live up to the standard of perfection that God requires. And how she just constantly had this feeling that she was unworthy of God's love. That's the way her life was, but not now. She'll, she'll still, after all these years, tear up when she talks about Jesus and his forgiveness. She says that when she first heard that message, it was like a ton of bricks fell off of her heart. She can't help but get emotional when she tells you of her knowledge of the message of salvation by grace through faith. That's a message that I would guess most of us, if not all of us, know. In fact, it's a message that probably many of us uh, have heard more and more longer than we can ever remember. That message of salvation by grace through faith is the heart and the core of our Christian faith, isn't it? In fact, we, we might say that one of the primary reasons we gather together on a weekly basis is to hear that message. To be assured again through word and through sacrament that we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus. And we're not ever disappointed, are we? You know, I, I have been a member of Wells all of my life. And in, in that period of time, I've heard a lot of sermons. Some memorable, some not so much, I'll be honest. I've been to all kinds of different Bible classes. And yet, regardless of, of what person was standing up in the church or teaching the class, regardless of what congregation it might have been in, one thing ran constant. One thing came through loud and clear. It was the message of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus. Never, not even once, did I ever hear anybody say, you'll be forgiven if, or you'll be forgiven but, or you're forgiven when, but always, always the message was you're already forgiven, past, present, and future for all your sins because of God's grace in Jesus Christ. Or as Paul puts it here, it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. You know why that message of salvation alone by God's grace through faith is so prominent in our midst? The answer to that question is because that message is the only true answer to sin. And there's nothing more dominant, more destructive, and more deadly in our world than sin. I, I know we don't, we don't hear much about sin today, do we? In fact, rarely outside of church do you ever hear the word, much less do people speak of it as the source of our problems. But no matter how much we brush it aside or belittle it, no matter how much we want to try to disguise it or defend it or downplay it, the fact remains that, that sin is the most destructive thing that any person can ever bring into their life. 
to call sin merely a mistake or an error in judgment, as we're so prone to do today, is, is about like calling a Category 5 tornado a gentle summer breeze. Our world may not want to talk a lot about sin today, but in his word, God mentions sin in no less than 689 different passages, and he mentions hell in 53 passages. When's the last time you just sat and pondered the destructive power of sin? Sin hurts the body. If you don't think so, talk to people whose livers have been destroyed through alcohol abuse, or, or people whose bodies are destroyed by STDs or drug abuse. Sin impairs the mind. It scars the memory. It reduces our mental faculties. It rivets our thoughts on the sensual and downplays the good and the beautiful. Sin mars the soul. It separates the soul from God and condemns its unforgiving victims to a never-ending death. And sin is never alone, is it? It always is seeking to entangle others, friends, relatives. Sometimes it carries its consequences down to the third and fourth generation. Ultimately, sin always leaves suffering in its wake. It brings agony and it, and it hurls hordes of people into hell. But you know, you want to hear the really scary thing? I am a sinner. In fact, I can't help but sin. No matter how much I may not want to do it, no matter how much I might strive to avoid it, sin is so woven into every fiber of my being that I end up having to say with the Apostle Paul, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but I cannot carry it out. Is there anybody here today who, who doesn't have to say the same thing? I know that in me there's nothing good that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Where would any of us be if we didn't have this beautiful truth it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. With those simple words, the Apostle Paul tells us that our salvation is a gift of God's grace, unearned, undeserved. It is a gift that he gives us freely because for some inexplicable reason, in spite of our sins, he still loves us. He loves us so much that he would send his one and only son to do what we could never do, to live perfectly in our place and then to go on to suffer the punishment that we deserve because of our sins. And then in his grace, he freely gives us all the blessings of Jesus' redeeming work. Forgiveness of all of our sins, past, present, and future. Answer to our prayers. Promise of his protection all through life and his providing care all through life. And ultimately, ultimately, the guarantee he gives us that, that we'll spend eternity with him in heaven. All that's summed up in the words, saved by grace. Hopefully, none of us here have started to take that message of God's free and faithful grace for granted. That can happen, you know, where we start to look at the good news like it's old news. Like it's yesterday's coffee or, or last month's newspaper. Brothers and sisters, if the message of God's redeeming grace 
doesn't warm your heart and get you excited, then we need to pick up this book and let it remind us of where we would be without that grace. We need to just let the Holy Spirit, through the words of this book, show us again the seriousness of our sins and then, and then show us the beauty, the awesome beauty of God's free grace in Christ. There's lots of reasons that God wants us to just bask in the sunshine of his grace. I'm going to mention a couple of them. One, and, and this is really critical, so that we cling ever more seriously to our Savior as our only hope. But another one, a very important one, is that we share that message of God's grace with others. Do you, know, do you know how many people there are in our world who still don't know of their salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ? Conservative estimate would say over 5 billion people. That's beyond my comprehension, that many people. But that's what the statistics tell us that there's all those people who don't live with the peace and the joy and the hope that you and I have in Christ. Some of those people, we all know. And so we can, we can witness to them, like the little girl we heard about in our first lesson, or the way Jesus witnessed in, in our, second, or our gospel lesson. We can tell people what we know, and we can pray for them. Those we don't know in the world, the billions we don't know, we can pray for them too. We can pray that, that the Lord will open their hearts to that message of the gospel and that he will send Christians near them or missionaries to them to witness to the gospel and bring them to faith. And one more thing we can all do is we can support the work of our church body to send missionaries to places where we can't go. I'm here today to speak about a certain portion of those billions who don't know Jesus. I'm talking about Mormons. There's 20 million of them right now. Now, 20 million may, may seem like a drop in the bucket compared to the billions in the world. But I have to tell you, that this is one of the most overlooked mission fields in the world because either people think they're already Christian, which they're not, or people don't want to have any contact with them or anything to do with them. And that's tragic because the, the Mormons are very zealous about their faith and eager to spread it to others. Do you know what their, their faith is? I, I don't have time to go into the whole explanation of it right now, but I'll, I'll give you one passage that is in the Mormon scriptures that is representative of their faith. It's, it's, it's similar but drastically different from the passage we're looking at. It's a passage from the book of the Second Nephi, from the Book of Mormon, and it says this, we know that we are saved by grace after all we can do. Did you catch that? I'm going to repeat it. We know we are saved by grace after all we can do. Can you appreciate why, why Susan lived so much of her early life in abject fear? Imagine if you have been taught that you would only live one day with Heavenly Father if you did all you can do. What person in the throes of guilt, what person lying on their de de deathbed uh, wouldn't have to wonder, have I done enough? Have I done all that I can do? Did I do it rightly? Did I do it with the right motive? Can I know? When will I know? Experience has taught us that the stress points that that Susan lived with early in her life, those stress points mark the lives of a, a host of Mormon people. They suffer from depression, anxiety, feelings of unworthiness, despair. Suicide rate among them is, is much higher than the general population. That's why we, we treat them not as 
enemies, but as victims. In our approach to them, we are not confrontational, throwing up barriers, but rather we try to build a bridge to them by approaching them in love. Through the internet, through door-to-door -door conversations, in whatever way we possi possible, we try to sow the seeds of the gospel message in their hearts with a prayer that the Lord will cause it to take root and bear fruit. And God is blessing our ministry. I, I could go on for a long time, but I'm, I'm going to only mention a few things. One, what started as a as a one-on-one -on -one ministry in Boise, Idaho, Idaho, is now a global ministry. Our internet connections enable us to reach people in virtually every country in the world. And we've had contacts from almost every country in the world. A year ago, we started writing personal devotions for Mormons. And we've had over 5,000 people ask for them. In a recent month, in a recent month, there were 1,000 online one-on-one -on -one conversations with searching Mormons giving us an opportunity to witness the message of grace alone. But we don't only reach out ourselves to Mormons, we try and equip other people to do that. And in the last years, we have now been able to teach 23,000 people our witnessing methods so that they can reach out not just to Mormons, but to others. Last year alone, 5,000 people registered online to go through our, our training course in how to witness. God has blessed this ministry in, in so many different ways. But there's so much more to do. And that's why I'm here. I'm here to ask for your help. I'm here to ask you to pray for us, to pray that God will bless what we do, open the hearts of Mormons, and, and cause that seed that is planted to take root in their hearts. I'm here to ask you to become informed about our ministry. There's all kinds of materials on the table in the back. You can pick some up as you leave. You can go online to our websites and learn all about the things that we're doing, and I encourage you to do that. I'm also going to encourage you and invite you to participate. We take groups out to Utah every year to witness door to door. We train them how to do it and give them an opportunity to do it. And if there's, there's like teenagers here, we provide scholarships that help them to pay for the trip out there. And I'm asking if you're so moved for your financial help. There, there's so much, so much to do and so much effort that needs to be put forth. But if we ever ask, is it worth it? I think we already know the answer, don't we? Because all of us have stood at the foot of the cross, we've looked up at our Savior in faith, and we've said with the hymn writer, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now join in the confession of our faith as Pastor Zappos leads us. If you're able, I invite you to stand for our common confession of faith. Living in a world where people believe that the universe was formed through chance and accident, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Living in a world where people are confronted with the guilt and punishment of sin, what do you believe Jesus did for you? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
and living in a world where people are without hope and certainty, what do you believe? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'd like to welcome you all here once again today. So glad you could join us for worship this morning. And we'd love to have a record of your visit. So at this time, we'll give you an opportunity to leave us with a record of your visit, either in the worship <laughs> register at the end of your pew or on our website. We join together in prayer. Again, if you're able, please stand. Today we have a couple of extra prayer requests. We pray for our sister, Wendy Tischendorf, who will have foot surgery this coming Friday. And we also pray for our brothers and sisters, Lee and Chris Erickson, as they just found out that their brother-in-law, Jim, has an advanced form of cancer uh, that will require treatment, but for which there is no cure. We, we pray for, for those and for all others in God's church as well. We pray. <clears throat> O oh Lord, our God, you are wise and powerful, good and gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide for the needs of your children on earth. We praise you for every grace and blessing. Strengthen your church in all the world. Let your comforting message of salvation in Jesus be proclaimed to troubled souls everywhere. Use our ministries and offerings to extend your healing and your hope. We bring you our requests for the various structures of our society. Bless our national, state, and local governments. Grant us civil servants who are worthy of honor and respect. Grant prosperity to our businesses and industries. Give employers a sense of fairness toward their workers and employees a feeling of joy and pride in their workmanship. Help us find satisfaction in all work well done. Invigorate the schools of our land. Give success to every effort that helps students read, think, and communicate in ways that will promote an informed and responsible citizenry. Arouse curious minds to discover the wonders of your creation. Give us teachers and students who pursue excellence. Strengthen the families of our country. Give fathers and mothers a renewed commitment to be good parents. Give children and young people the wisdom to regard their parents as your representatives. Lead us to love one another as you have loved us. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. <clears throat> Heavenly Father and great physician, we come before you today on behalf of our sister, Wendy Tischendorf, who will undergo surgery this week. We ask that you would guide those who care for her, for the surgeon who performs the operation. Grant her quick recovery, that, that she might return here to join us again soon to, to hear your word and to join in encouraging one another. Heavenly Father, we also pray for the brother-in-law of Lee and Chris, who, who's recently been diagnosed with cancer. We pray that you would comfort him with the, the comfort of, of Jesus, that the grace that you have shown to us, you have shown to all, 
certainly to Jim as well. We, we ask that you would comfort him as he wrestles with his own mortality, as you comfort us all as we, as we, rest, as we wrestle with the reality of, of death. Bring comfort in, in the cross that, that has, for, where, where forgiveness has been won and point us all, especially Jim, to the empty tomb where death has been defeated. Gracious Father, you have restored to us the joy of your salvation. With happy hearts, we come before you and say, Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Amen. Father, we bring these prayers before you confident that you will hear and answer them. For it was your only Son who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn. Grace has a thrilling sound. Good morning to you all once again. So glad you could be here for worship today. Uh, a special welcome to Pastor Phil Kelpine, and thanks for bringing God's word to us today. Bible study, um, we are not having the take-home Bible study this week. That will resume again next week. There's also a lot more information coming out. It should be this week about our fall um, education schedule with information about our, our new Sunday school plan, adult Bible classes, um, all sorts of things that are going to be happening in the, next co in, the, uh, in the coming months. So keep your eyes out for that. Also, lots of reminders, all sorts of things we've been talking about here at Mount Olive for a long time. You'll find it on the, the printout of the announcements and also on our website, mountoliveswamico.com forward slash, remember, news, right? news, that's how you find it. Um, we're going to give Pastor Kelpine just a few minutes to tell us just a few more things about Truth and Love Ministries. He also has a display you probably saw on your way in today, and he'll be around to answer any questions you might have um, on your way out. Lord's blessings to you all the rest of this week. Rest easy. I'm not going to keep you long. I know uh, how sometimes when you're sitting there and after church you got more announcements. Anyway, I, you may well be wondering, 
you know, why are we talking about reaching out to Mormons in Swamico, Wisconsin? Uh, there's not a Mormon temple in the state of Wisconsin. The closest one is Illinois. And many of you have probably uh, never even come into contact with a Mormon. I'm going to just give you four quick reasons why I, I want to want to encourage you to be a participant. First of all, uh, don't underestimate them. There is a Mormon church in Green Bay, and the number of Mormons are growing in Wisconsin, and more and more, uh, you talk to people who all of a sudden, maybe they're, they're, one of their children starts dating one or whatever, their influence is very powerful. Uh, secondly, and I mentioned this in the sermon, the Mormon church is uh, one of the most overlooked mission fields in the world because most people, I love that kid, <laughs> because most people uh, think they're Christian, which they're not. They're not at all. You heard that. Uh, and and uh, a lot of reason, too, is because people are just intimidated by them. They don't want to, instead of opening the door and trying to witness to them, they slam the door in their face when the Mormon missionaries come around. So uh, they're an overlooked mission field. Thirdly, Truth and Love Ministry that I'm here representing uh, is what we would call a parasynodical organization. That's a big word, and I don't know if you're familiar with it. Fox Valley Lutheran is a parasynodical. In other words, it's, it's uh, all of its faculty and everything are from the wells. It's, 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 it's affiliated with us, but it's not supported by the synod. It's supported by a federation of congregations. Truth and Love Ministry is, is all staffed by Wells people. Uh, the pastors on our staff, the workers on our staff are all Wells people. We're, that's a blessing. They're all Wells trained. But we're not supported by our synod, and we don't have a congregation to support us. We're only supported by individual people, uh, friends of our ministry. So that, that's the third reason. And then the fourth reason is, yeah, even if, if you don't have an opportunity to witness to Mormons, which we could give you, but even if you don't have that opportunity, our methodology of witnessing, you can learn it online, and, and it is a beautiful method to free, reach your friends and neighbors and relatives and talk to them about Jesus. So uh, you can still be benefited from our ministry, even though it, you may not have Mormons in contact. Uh, if you have any questions, as Pastor Zaffer said, I'll be there, and... Uh, invite you to take, we've got folders with all kinds of materials you can take home and read up about it. God's blessings. Thank you for the privilege of being here.